God makes all things beautiful in his time. Amen. In his time. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Like I said, uh, permit me to preach this morning. Amen. I don't want to teach this morning. I want to preach. So you, you got to help me out. Amen. Can you help me out? Can you help me? You're gonna, or do I need to get Elijah down real quick? Okay, okay, okay. All right, so where, where, where are we starting? The three scriptures, I'm going to take my, I'm going to form a Bermuda Triangle this morning. I'm going to drop three scriptures on you and then we're going to shout. Amen? Is that good? I'm going to drop three scriptures on you real quick and then we're going to shout. Romans 4, 17. <laughs> if you're there, say I'm there. If you're not there, say wait for me. If you're there, say I'm there. If you're not there, say I'm too slow. <laughs> Romans 4, 17. Uh, and if you want to put a marker in your Bible in 2 Corinthians 4, 6. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. And then Mark eleven twenty two. Like I said, we're going to plot the triangle and then we'll shout. And when it's time to shout, you better shout. Paul, if you find me one nice, not now, but at the a proper time, find me one nice Southern Baptist organ, you know, I just want to want to get my groove on this morning. Michael, you better get yourself on that drums because I'm going to need you in a bit. Romans 4, 17. It says, as it is written. In fact, let, 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 let's start from... Start from, from 13 for context. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham... Or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Now, you just take my effect down just a tiny bit, just a not too much, a tiny bit. Remember, we spoke about the fact that faith connects you to the purposes and the will of God, and the stuff you receive is a byproduct. But faith really is designed to align you with the kingdom of God so you can be who God wants you to be. Amen. And the Bible says, The promise, so I'll say promise. Faith is not for houses and cars, it's for destiny. Amen. Now, the promise that he should be the heir of the world, which was Abraham's destiny, was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, meaning not just through the instruction or through legaliz- legalism. Someone say legalism. But it was through the righteousness of faith. Someone said the righteousness of faith. That's a different message for a different day, the righteousness of faith. There is righteousness of the law and there's a righteousness of faith. The word righteousness does not just mean right standing with God as we've been taught. It means whatever is acceptable to God. Amen. Amen. We looked at last week, the Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that will even think about coming to God must first exercise faith to believe that God is which for many people is a struggle. Even for many Christians. Because we don't act out the fact that God is. And that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So your diligence in seeking God is an act of faith. The fact that you come to church with your nostrils you know, red and your sinuses blocked is an act of faith the fact that you wake up at six in the morning without your sleep and you fall on your face is an act of faith the fact that you give tithe and offering in spite of your financial difficulties is an act of faith the fact that you take a licking and keep on ticking hear bad news and keep a good attitude is an act of faith because you are it takes diligence to seek god we live in a generation where everybody wants everything to be nice and cuddly and muddly and fuzzy dozy and we want it microwaved and served hot you know, but I grew up in a body of Christ where I was told that I had to put my back into it sometimes. You know, I didn't get saved by repeating one prayer after a man of God. No, I was in my bedroom travailing, saying, God, save my soul. I didn't get spat on to speak in tongues. That's why my tongues are bona fide. Because you don't birth an elephant in five minutes. Amen. Amen. I, I groaned. I, I tarried. I'm not saying God can do it instantly, but, but we seem to have lost the act the art of diligence in seeking diligence means hard working and consistent it means i will do it till it does i will hit it till it speaks bible says he that coming to god must first believe that he is and he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him i preached about seeking the face of god a few weeks ago it's on on youtube talking about pursuing and running after the desires and the purposes and the direction of god for you but let's keep moving 
but through the righteousness of faith. There is something about faith that makes you righteous. When you take God at his word and you align yourself with his instructions, you become acceptable to him. For if they which are of the law be hares, the Bible says, if those that just do things legalistically and obey without... In- See, Pastor Larry said something on... T- we are talking about something the other day. I don't know if he, pre- he said that on Friday. That when you become a lover of God, some things become simple. P. Sheps called me this morning said, are you going to be in church? I said, <laughs> for sure. Some of you are too, too posh to understand that. And for those of us on the street... I said for sure meaning for sure there's no way i'm missing church this morning before because before there was a child there was a god amen Amen. and i'm not gonna now i'm not the one being examined in the hospital so you know i don't have an excuse and it wasn't because i was preaching even if i wasn't preaching i'd be here because i was glad when they said to me let's go to the house of the lord it's not about legalism i see i am addicted to god i i I just so love this thing we call christianity because i love or i don't just love it i love the man or the god behind it he found me picked me up from the gutter placed my feet upon solid ground let me move on quickly You don't become a hare by the law. You don't become a hare by legalism. You don't become a hare by storing knowledge of the Bible in your brain. You become it by faith. Somebody say by faith. Meaning, in essence, the, what was the law? Let me break this down. You know, I, I'm just, I just have to teach. I'm sorry. It's in my blood. I'm trying to preach, but let me break this down. It's just in my blood. I'm, I'm an instructor by nature. I was born teaching. Uh, my mom would tell you, when I was one year old, I was teaching everybody around the village, you know. Say, that's a dog, that's a goat, that's a cat, you know. So that's just who I am. What was the law? The law was the instruction of God to man. True. So in essence, the law itself was once the word of God. The thing we call, the thing we talk about, the law, the law, as if it's some dirty thing. No, no, no. The law was actually what God delivered to man to mark out the boundaries of man's relationship with him. Are you with me? The problem was it was written on tables of stone. It was secondhand conveyed. Only one person ever really got the spirit of the law, and that was Moses. Because he see the problem with getting a word from God is when you receive instruction without encounter, it is dead. The Bible says the spirit gives life, but the letter kills. Now, one person took it in the presence of God and brought it down to three million people who had it transferred. And the Bible says Moses knew his ways, but Israel only knew his acts. Because when you get an instruction or a word or a method of behavior from a being you do not have a connection with, it is dead. Are you with me? Bible says you don't become a hair of your promise by law you don't become a hair of your destiny by legalism reading the Bible won't help in itself coming to church won't help in itself no 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 there is something that must be done stay with me stay with me stay with me then faith is made void and the promises of non effect for the law works wrath for where no law is, there is no transgression. I, I mean, this is beautiful stuff, but I don't have time to go there this morning. Therefore, it is a faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those which are of the law, but that also which is of faith of Abraham, blah, 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 blah. Now, verse 17. As it is written, now God is speaking. This is the law or God's promise to Abraham, sorry. The promise of faith to Abraham. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations before him whom he believed even God stay with me who quickens the dead say God quickens the dead the word quickens means gives life are you with me who quickens the dead and calls those things which be not as though they were stay with me now the Bible says it is God the God in whom Abraham had faith in amen because you got to be careful who you have faith in because the bible says you must first believe that god is is what that's the first question of faith 
what is God? Wrong question. What am God? He says, I am. Not I am in terms of I'm. No, I am. Existence finds its essence in me. But now when faith is focused, because the problem with the human mind is it's too puny to wrap itself around the entirety of God because scripture says his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts and as far as the heavens are above the earth so far are his thinking patterns from our thinking patterns so the problem now is how does a three-dimensional human being wrap himself or his mind around a multi-dimensional God I preached this a few days a few weeks ago how does a two-dimensional thing or one-dimensional dot on a wall understand me who I'm three dimensions because I don't exist in its plane are you with me one that di- one dimension is a dot two dimensions is a square or rectangle or plane three dimensions includes breadth length and so we live in a three-dimensional world or technically a four-dimensional world because time is a fourth dimension but the point I'm trying to say is when you go down a dimension you lose detail remember I said that you lose so if you take me I took a picture this morning amen and it looked like I was just flat in the picture because it lost my width are you with me now God exists in multiple dimensions so we who are three dimensions or dimensional can only experience him in the intersection so when i put my foot on the floor the two-dimensional world thinks i'm a footprint are you with me if i lie down on the floor the two-dimensional world thinks i'm a silhouette are you with me talk to me somebody when you take a picture of me the two-dimensional world thinks i'm that picture the problem now is god is in the bible says he inhabits eternity But when he intersects to the earth, he distills himself into things we can comprehend. God is not a father. Fatherhood is the closest analogy God could find to explain a dimension of his nature. Are you with me? God's not a provider. No, 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 no. Because to provide something means it wasn't there before. Amen. But but Jehovah Jireh was the closest God could get to explain to Abraham the fact that with God there is no lack at all. Are you with me? Can you handle this this morning? I've only got 20 minutes more. And so he that cometh to God must first believe that God first of all exists. He is. Amen. He is. That's where the atheists fall off the bandwagon. And the agnostics too. You've got to be sure that God exists. There can be no doubt in your mind. And hear me, many Christians confess, see. They confess, see, that God exists, see. But they don't really believe, see. Because your behavior in a pen shows me who you really are. When you when you when you when you're dealt a crisis, when the rubber hits the road, when when the metal goes to the pedal, then we understand if you really believe God exists. Because many of you act like God doesn't exist. Because if He does, y'all wouldn't be doing what you do. Or maybe the problem is the second issue: What is He to you? Because if you understand, like I preached a few weeks ago, that He's omnipresent. You won't be bumping and grinding because he's right there watching you. Mm -hmm. Next time you want to take your knickers down, just picture God with a front row seat. Just tell yourself you're forcing God to watch porn. Because the Bible says he's everywhere and nothing is hid from his gaze. That ought to get you fixed up real quick. Amen. Come on now. The second question is, what is he to you? Because he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. But to seek something, you must give it an identity. Because the way you seek one thing is, how do you seek a doctor? Make an appointment, go to the hospital, lay down on the, on the whatever, right? How do you seek a lawyer? Okay, how do you seek a policeman? You commit a crime, that's how you seek a... Exactly. You commit a crime, that's how you seek a policeman. The point I'm trying to make is... The identity you confer on God... 
will determine the level or, or the method by which you approach it. I, 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 I've got to I've got to back up with this thing. I'm trying to run, but see, every god in history, every idol, every pagan god, including our god in history, the character of the god is clearly expressed by the method of worship that he demands. Stay with me. You can tell. Okay, give an example. Married men, amen. You can tell the character of a man by how his wife has to get stuff from him. Because the women learned early that rubbing the husband's head doesn't work. He's impervious to that stuff. Amen. He's darling, honey, it doesn't work. So you make sadza. And jima. Amen. That, for some men, that's how it goes. Amen. And beans, amen. Because for those men, the way is food. For some other men, all you need to do is wear a pair of heels and walk into... Like, baby, what's happening? What do you want? Tell me. Now, you see, I'll give you an example. Let's look at some gods in the Bible. There's a God called Molech. Quickly, I, I need to run, I need to run, I need to run, I need to run, I need to run. There's a God called Molech in scripture. And the worship of Molech was by offering child sacrifices. Listen to me, somebody. I'm going somewhere important. To worship Molech in scripture, you offer children by fire. What kind of God does that tell you he is? The same God we have in the West today. In the West, we call it abortion. Okay. To worship Baal, how did the, how did the Baal prophets try and get his attention? Cut themselves. Amen. Amen. The same God we have today. Violence. Amen. Right? Okay. To worship Astaroth and Baal as well, you had sex with temple prostitutes. The temple priests of Baal were actually prostitutes and sexual urges were part of the worship. For instance, how did the Israelites worship the golden calf? You get me? So it tells you about the mind of a God. When you come to some people's house, you take your shoes off. When you come to some other people's house, you come with mud, they don't mind. Amen. Some people are nice and easy. I get offended when the pulpit is turned wrongly. So the way you conduct yourself around me tells you a lot about my nature. Are you with me? So you must settle the issue of who this God is to you to determine how to diligently seek him. And he says he will reward you to the degree and the method that you seek him. What God is saying is you show me by your behavior what you think I am and I will be to you what you tell me I am not with your mouth but with your lifestyle it works for churches too some churches you go to you stay there one month and you just become rich because as far as the past is concerned and I'm not saying it's wrong I'm just right true some other churches you go to just get healed amen judges you go to you just get slain and wrecked and your life just gets destroyed because you can't go back to amen a pastor once asked me how is it that every time i come to your church there's an outbreak of glory is it only special events i said no it's every day sir he asked me why i said one i i, I sat down and i thought and i i wanted to say because i fast and i pray i don't need chicken wings but you know because i fast and i pray but but you know but i came to the conclusion it wasn't that you know it's very simple why because we expect it True? subconsciously we have come to expect are you with me that when we come to church on a sunday or on a thursday that something will break out and that's faith and god says okay since you and, and, and we de- we don't just expect we demonstrate we get here an hour before to lie down on the altar to pray amen if, uh, when we're worshiping if we feel we haven't hit the spot we keep going you, you get what i'm trying to say we demonstrate by our behavior that we are seeking the god of encounter now imagine if you act, okay I'll give you an example another example when i started out in ministry uh, my primary supernatural gifting was what we call deliverance amen i walked into a room and if you had a demon boom you know my, I'm just telling I wouldn't even know I'd walk past a person and my shadow would touch them and they start to manifest because as far as I was concerned I was raised by a deliverance warrior in the spirit 
And I began to fast and pray and say, God, I want healing. I want to be able to heal. And God said, son, it's the same Holy Spirit, you know. But I said, but you know, I've noticed that when I lay hands on people, demons come out. But no, they get sicker if they're sick. I'm just joking. And so I called a 40-day fast. And God would have been kind if he spoke to me on day two or three. But he waited 40 days to inform me that what I was fasting for, I already had. The problem was I expected deliverance to happen. I did not expect healing to happen. And so I went on a 24-month journey to recondition my mind. Because I would be there like, mm, be healed. And, and, and I was like, no, 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 no. That's not how it works. So I had to renew my mind like scripture says. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I had to keep reminding myself that the Bible says by his stripes we were healed that this sign would follow those that believed if they casted out demons they should also talk to me somebody they should also come on somebody say they should also lay hands on the sick the bible didn't say and they would just be the bible said they will recover some of them recover instantaneously like we heard a testimony today somebody was prayed for on friday some of them take a few days to recover my job is to pray his job is to decide how long it takes for you to recover but now i expect it does that make sense so the bible says he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him now the punchline says he quickens the dead now this is the god abraham saw this was the god abraham pursued are you with me stay with me somebody this was the distillation of God that Abraham diligently sought don't change it who quickens the dead now remember Abraham said Bible says in the the book of Hebrews that Abraham told himself even if Isaac dies God is able to raise him back from the dead how did Abraham get there Abraham first of all saw an 80 something year old woman become so quickened what quickened means life to give life Abraham saw the word of God work on Sarah's body to a point where an 80 something year old woman became so young and supple that two kings wanted her picture it imagine a king having his pick you know how do you say how, how, how do you say chicks in shona or, or, or babes in shona how do you say babes in shona pardon babes ha. imagine the king having his pick of all the babes he could say come with me ijoji and it's an 80 something year old old expired yes I'm just telling you true she was expired she was past it wasn't monopause it was mono stop or meno stop sorry it wasn't menopause the meno had stopped and when God spoke Sarah's body began to receive life her wrinkles began to change you know the sagging bits began to lift until Abimelech said hey baby imagine a hundred year old man with his walking stick every day going to his wife's hut you know some things should slow down as you age although some African men don't understand you know they believe that as their age is so should their strength be but as you get older you should respect yourself because you know some things are not that easy to accomplish anymore science will tell you that you know just that in- come on talk to me most men at 60 70 start taking drugs to defy gravity you understand what i'm saying and here's a hundred year old man stumbling into his wife's bed every night saying baby let's try again tonight maybe god said i'm just go you look at me like shut up not pretending like you don't know what I'm talking about I'm preaching the Bible I'm preaching the Bible Uh, let's be real and Abraham must have seen the law of gravity defied gradually and the dry pump one day began to rush oh you guys don't understand I'm preaching I'm preaching to the point where by the time he was offering Isaac a man who was over a hundred about 113 or 16 according to scholars 
could wrestle with it. When you think Isaac just lay down there to be, no, 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 I don't believe that. I don't believe that, that Isaac just, Isaac just, just decided to, no, 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 no. I can tell you there was a struggle. I, I'm sure there was a struggle. I'm sure there was a struggle. I'm sure there was a struggle. He carried the wood up the hill himself with his son. When there was a war, almost a hundred years old, a lot was taken. Abraham took 300 and something men and fought three kings and won. And he led from the front. He saw the quickening power of God rejuvenate his life. And he concluded the same God that could reverse the effect of aging must be able to raise a person from the dead. And that's why God said, it wasn't just because he offered Isaac. God knew that his son one day was going to have to be raised from the dead. And this is the principle. God can't do anything in the earth until there is a pattern established in the mind of a man. Talk to me. The kingdom of heaven must first come in you before it can come through you. See, there must first be a demonstration by humanity before God. See, oh, come on. Talk to me, somebody. There has to be a for If you look through scripture. There always has to be a foreshadowing. A human being moved by the Holy Spirit, by faith, will do something that is a prophetic prototype of something God intends to do. Come on with me. And that act of faith unlocks heaven for God to release the full manifestation. And when a man found faith and said, I believe God can bring back a dead thing, God said, boom! Now Jesus can be born. Now Jesus can come. That's the first God Abraham saw. Very quickly, now come with me because I, I, I need to wrap this up. I'm doing good for time, right? It's, it's quarter two. I'm doing good. Second Corinthians four six. Second Corinthians four six. It says, "For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts." to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I wish I could unpack that. That's deep, but I, I, only, I can only deal with the surface this morning. It says, God who commanded, somebody say he commanded, the light to shine where? Why do, see, why do, Christians, ex, see, why do Christians expect God to do a miracle where there's already a miracle? It's only in Christianity that I see torch lights afraid of darkness. It is beneath the dignity of a God to stoop down to do what man can do. Are you with me? Oh, help me, somebody. When they come and say, Pio, uh, Pio, please, I just, I'm just praying, I'm just hoping. I don't even know, but maybe you'll find it out. Talk, P.S. I need 50p. I, I just, you know who you're talking to? 50p. God commanded the light to shine in where? No, but what, from where? Where, where? where was the light shining first? Out of what? Darkness. He says he has now shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus the Messiah. I'll come back and deal with that. Quickly, Mark eleven twenty two. Mark eleven twenty two. Mark eleven twenty two. Let me let me let me let me see if I can get this preach going now. Mark eleven twenty two. start from verse verse 21 now this is after jesus has commanded the fig tree to, to, to dry up peter calling to remember said to him master behold the fig tree which you cursed is withered away jesus spoke a word 24 hours later the fig tree died and jesus answering said unto them have faith in god for verily i say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain be thou removed and be cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart but shall believe that those things which he said shall come to pass he shall have whatsoever he says now Jesus says, have faith in God. Now, the Greek translated says, have the faith of God. Meaning, do what God did. And you will see what God saw. Are you with me? Do 
what God did and you will see what God saw. Now, on Thursday, we established that faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's not just spurious or spooky. Faith is tangible stuff you can hold. It comes when your spirit reacts with a word from God. You can't fake it. You can't conjure it up. You can't gather faith. It comes. Amen. So it can, faith can be summoned. It has to come. Faith is tangible. It can be measured. It's a product of a chemical reaction between your human spirit and an inspired word of God. And when it comes, it's substance, substance, something you can stand on. You have it. You know. It's not futuristic. You're not believing for it anymore. In that moment, you receive what you're now. You can't see it yet. So faith literally is receiving something invincible or invisible before it becomes visible it then says it's the evidence of what we can see it's the proof in your actions of the reality of the thing you are believing for that you cannot yet see are you with me the bible says have the faith of god what was the faith of god genesis chapter 1 god looked at darkness the bible says he created the world between verse, verses 1 and 2 i believe and i'm sure when i look at scripture that what happened was the fall of man i don't have time to preach that but look at isaiah and a few of the prophets the fall of man happened Satan fell like lightning from heaven established his kingdom on the earth and brought with him chaos darkness and disaster and god didn't trip god didn't trip isaiah says the earth was made to be inhabited God had a plan for the earth and that plan was interrupted and God took his time, sipped some coffee, crossed his legs and says, watch this. The same way there's people in this room this morning who have a destiny upon your life and that destiny has been interrupted and God says, I want you to demonstrate my kind of faith. Oh, let me get some water here. Let me get some water. I'm going to need it. So the earth is void, empty formless shapeless dark and the bible says there are waters everywhere confusion <laughs> but satan made one mistake he allowed the spirit of god hover upon the waters is god's spirit inside you somewhere are you the temple of the holy ghost are you the temple of god then watch this watch this watch this so god stepped back and said okay let's do this and he looked at the darkness and the bible says god said let there be light or in the hebrew in the hebrew light be so say light be god said light appear that's what he said in hebrew light come out and the bible said and there was light bear in mind on day four god creates the sun and the moon and says give light in the day and night so it begs the question what light was god talking about stay with me remember i said faith is substance right and evidence help me somebody the bible says god is light God is not a light God is light and to make it clear that the translator of King James understood grammar the same Bible says he is the father of lights so we have a distinction between lights and light God is not one of the lights he is the definition of light and light now i said this light is not vision light is not illumination no 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 all these are byproducts of light i know we're taught in church light means revelation no no, no. revelation comes when there's light light is a function of glory light is not see, see oh mare kora mara mara bo 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 shata see light light is the essence of god that produces the bible says in the light of his countenance we have light when god is there the byproduct is vision revelation and illumination but light is not the illumination light is the essence of who god is so god wants to demonstrate faith this is god's first example to man amen now and our children are not monkeys but they say monkey see monkey do you pull a face at a child the child pulls the same face back at you right 
So God is training his children and he says, do like I do. God looks at darkness and he doesn't bother himself with what he's seeing. He reaches into himself, faith. There is substance in God and then he now makes corresponding action as evidence. God drags out of his soul the essence of his being, which is light. Now he, he looks at himself when he's talking and he commands and says light be and he pulls light out of himself projects it onto darkness and the bible says there was light corinthians says he commanded someone say commanded oh help me somebody he didn't beg he didn't cry he didn't roll on the floor he didn't feel sorry for himself he didn't say why me no 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 because See, like Joseph, who was a son of God, he understood that my problem is not, it's not my environment. It's not my church building. It's not my car. You can take all these things away as long as there is substance inside of me and I can make corresponding action as long as I can demonstrate the evidence of what is inside of me, I can create anything. All I have to do is reach into myself. Are you with me? Now, the problem, the old te- the reason why faith wasn't really preached in the Old Testament was in the Old Testament, God came upon men. But in the New Testament, the Bible says the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily in Christ and he is the one at work within us to will that's faith God's instruction to will and then the obedience to do of his good pleasure Christ inside of us is our only hope to glory but faith is a substance of things hope for so faith is the substance of the now what's the glory the essence the fullness the weight of who God is so true faith at its deepest level is not give me a car no true faith is looking at the fullness of God and saying I am who God is I have what God has and as a byproduct of that faith you can now reach inside you to get the peace of God that you need per time and to project it and so God commanded the light to shine out of darkness and the Bible says now that that same light is shining in our heart I'm closing let me close with this so Romans says God is the one who quickens the dead amen and God calls somebody say calls oh Rabasate. somebody talk to me this morning somebody say calls calls Sarah they're not talking to me you just you just stand with me and let's 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 hang out this morning God calls the things that don't exist yet as though they are the word calling Greek is the word kaleo it literally means to invite the Bible says all things work together for good for those poor help me out who love God and are called the word means is they have been invited Kaleo means to be extended an invitation to come and participate in the purposes of God are you with me are you with me are you with me God tells Jeremiah, hey, help me, help me, help me, help me, help me. Holy Spirit, help me, help me, help me this morning. God tells Jeremiah, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I yadarge you. I had an intimate relationship with you. But I didn't just stop at yadarring you. I invited you to be a prophet to the nations. Now, whether or not you accept the invitation is a different matter entirely. But I called you someone say call you now your calling is not to be an apostle or prophet that's your foreknowledge or your predestination i mean romans 8 says for those who he foreknew he predestined and then he called now now, your predestination is where you are going to get to that's your destiny your foreknowledge is who you are going to be when you get there but your calling is the process the instruction the transaction in a moment in time by which god reveals to you 
what your predestination and your foreknowledge were. God says, okay boy, this is what you're born to do. This is where you're born to go. The calling is the utterance. Someone say utterance. It means to utter, to speak. Now, remember, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the rema, by the speaking, by the release of word of God. So the rema is the calling of God. When God says something to you, he's not informing you. He is instructing you. He is inviting you into participation. Are you with me? So sit down, sit down for a second. Now, so when God says, Amanda, you're going to marry a man of God and you and I'm, I am prophesying by the way you're going to marry a man of God I am prophesying by the way man amen you're going to marry a man of God and you are in yourself a woman of God there is a prophetic intercessory gift upon your life and the, now God's not telling you no 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 oh Jesus get me some water get me some water I, I, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me let me land this morning God's not telling you so you can start dancing and call all your girlfriends and say, did you hear the word today? Oh, I'm going to be a prophet. No, 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 no. It ain't about all that. No. You know, God's not asking you to go and, to go and buy a domain name and launch a website. Monday Ministries. No, 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 no. It doesn't mean you start printing your credit your, or your, 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 your card or your, 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 your what's it called now? Your complimentary card. And when you can say, my name is prophetess. No, 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 no. God is peeling back the veil. All the days of your life have been written before one of them existed. God is unveiling your eyes to see what has been prepared for you. Because scripture says that you are the workmanship of God prepared for good works from the foundations that you should walk in them now God is saying I have prepared them for you I am inviting you to join me to walk in them are you with me that's why faith is evidence so our scripture says faith without works is dead are you with me now the Bible says God calls come with me God calls not just people but things that be not as though they were. The same way God invites you, Lynette, into destiny, right? God invites everything that you need to fulfill your destiny. As God is preparing you for a place, He's preparing the place for you. The same, now, the difference is humanity. Listen to me. You can stand and shout, but listen. Humanity is the one being this side of heaven, minus the angels, on the earth. Humanity is the only being, the only thing, living or dead as we see it, because there's no such thing as a dead thing. Rocks cry out, waves obey, mountains clap. It's just the level of life each thing has. There's, not, there's no such thing as a non-living thing. They just have a lower form of life. But humanity is the only life form that has the ability to say no to God. That's because we're in His image. We're the only life form on earth. That has been given the right to tell God, no, 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 that's not right, not me. So while God is calling you, Lynette, and is sitting you down and is revealing these things to you, Amanda, while God is speaking to you, stand there for me, for me. So, so, okay, now let's assume that that Lynette and Amanda, Lynette and Amanda, are about to start a business that's going to blossom into a multi-million dollar enterprise. Amanda's in a bedroom. God's speaking to her. God is calling her. God is inviting you. Now, this is how God calls. God will say, go to school. Mm -hmm. now, 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 many of us are waiting for an audible voice. But God says, attend your lectures. Do your coursework. And go to work. Amen. Attend that seminar. Get those skills. Pray. Now, all these things. You, he that is led by the Spirit of God is the Son of God. God begins to invite you into purpose. Now, now Amanda is obeying herself on this side. On the other side of the world. Or on the other side of Nottingham, before they met each other, God is speaking to Lynette. Now, God is preparing Amanda for her part in this. He's preparing Lynette for her part in it as well. Now, God said, Lynette, do this, do that, stop this, kick these friends out, stop hanging out with these people. Start doing that. God is calling you. You see it as instructions to holiness. But God is inviting you. And everything you obey brings you closer to purpose and destiny. Now, the two of them can say no if they want. And God forbid, if one of them says no, God puts you aside and then God now invites somebody else into the plan. Amen. And God says, start warming up, start warming up. 
Stop, 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 stop jogging on the spot. Go on, jog, 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 jog. You're young, jog. Now, now, how many of you watch football matches? When one player is messing up, the coach gets a sub and says, Rooney, no, no, Rooney, go run. You know, Rooney's on the bench, amen. Go run up and down the sideline, amen. And Rooney's stretching. And he's, hmm, you know, ish, ish, ish. You get older, man. And Rooney, ish, I need this thing, Panador. You know, and Rooney is, you know, moving and he's getting ready because he's getting ready to be invited. Now, at whatever point Robert begins to mess up, Ferguson says, Robert, do you, you, just, you just come out, amen. Say, now, now, but God calls us in and out. But now, this is a beauty. Rooney can decide to show up at the match or not. Welbeck can decide to play or not. But the grass, the pitch, the posts, the lights, the chairs, everything that is needed for that football match to be played other than the players has no choice but to be there. And as, as UEFA releases the fixtures and the Man United team is training the groundsmen are watching that pitch. They're marking out the dimensions. As Rooney is doing stretches in training, the pitch he is going to perform on is being prepared and the pitch does not have a choice. Now, Rooney can decide to show up and play, but that pitch is gonna be there. And this is the beautiful thing. Where Old Trafford now is, once was an empty expanse of ground raw dirty clumpy earth and an architect had the audacity to draw up the plans for a 70 something thousand football stadium and he walked with david gill or whoever was no, david Gilbert wasn't born then whoever was the man united chief executive at the time and he said the toilets are going to be here the pitch is going to be here the offices are going to be here and as they were walking all they could see was earth and the architect went back to his bedroom and began to draw and plan and structure what was he doing he was calling old trafford into being while it was not now old trafford always existed where in the mind of the architect are you with me are you with me talk to me somebody as he began to draw he was exercising faith he was lifting out the plans he saw from his spirit onto a piece of paper and when he gave that piece of paper to the master builder the master builder saw it and it did not just look like a piece of paper that the four men saw the stadium before it was finished because when the plans were delivered he says i know what this is so now he begins to call the workmen and says you start on this side you build now the workmen have no clue where they're going they're just obeying instructions but in the mind of the architect and in the mind of the master builder, that project is finished. And as things begin to come together, one person is walking on the Stratford end, the other person is walking on the other end, one person is building the stand, the other person is making the designs for the windows. And as things begin to come together, they reach a point where a normal human being walking past begins to say, something's going on here. I don't know how it's going to be, but you get to a point in your life now where People begin to say, I see destiny upon you. I mean, stand up, stand up, stand up. I see the hand of God upon you. You walk into a church and the prophet says, I see purpose. I, and and now, the, the, now the Bible says we prophesy in part because we don't have the full picture God does. But we now begin to see the dealings of God concerning you. But only two people really have a clue. You and God. They begin to source of bricks. They begin to order metal and steel. And what are they doing? As everything arrives on site, they're calling. Someone say calling. They're calling. They're calling. They're calling. The Bible says God, Jehovah, El, right? El, Elohim, calls, invites things that are not as though they were. This is the problem with many Christians. When we want to call, this is how we call. Um, it would be nice. I could have a husband um, it'd be nice like Pastor Larry said if I can feed the children my children it'd be nice if I can walk in a healing anointing but God said so no 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 that's not how I work God didn't say um light no 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 God said light be and he walked away 
and the Bible says behind him light was and then on day seven hey man I'm told boy day six sorry when you read Genesis chapter one the last verse in Genesis one blew my mind the Bible says God saw what he created for six days God was calling without seeing you don't believe me open your Bible Genesis 1 Genesis 1 come on come on Genesis 1 let me show you let me show you everybody turn to Genesis 1 because this is what don't sit down yet stand with me I've been standing all day and all night Genesis 1 amen verse 31 let's read together Genesis 1 31 on the screen everybody let's read together one are we ready guys Genesis 131 and God saw everything that he had made and behold it was good and the evening and the morning were the sixth day come with me to chapter 2 look at look at verse 2 in chapter 2 and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made what did God spend the first six days doing talking what work did God need to rest from how many of you are always tired because you speak too much the Bible says the words that I speak are spirit and life God upholds all things by the word of his power words use power and words release power and every time you talk that's why you will be judged for every idle word because this is how you operate the faith of God you release something the Bible says we if you believe in your heart and then you speak with your mouth when you pull out what was in your spirit through your vocal faculties you are doing work you are releasing virtue amen that's why preaching is hard work now keep going look at verse look at verse eight look at verse seven sorry and the lord god formed man out of the dust of the ground i thought he created man in chapter one talk to me i thought he created man in chapter one but the bible says on the seventh day he formed man out of the dust of the ground can you see it in chapter in verse eight and he planted a garden eastward in eden talk to me somebody talk to me 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 in verse 19 and out of the ground the lord formed every beast of the field every fowl of the air but i thought he called them and created them in chapter one this is the faith of god let me explain to you in a nutshell are you ready to shout are you ready to shout okay this is how god works but looks at a situation that's dirt now he's called you before the foundations of the world he's invited you from before you were born Bible says he knew you before you existed and he called you then and so that's why you find even if you're not saved as you walk through life you feel compulsions and tugs and pullings and you don't know why you just have to do this but you just have to do it you know why because your spirit has been instructed before you were born and you are just finding out as you walk through life that those instructions are ringing in your spirit are you with me somebody are you with me somebody are you with me somebody the bible says it came to the heart of moses that he should be the deliverer of the jews god didn't speak audibly but moses knew in his spirit because before he was formed god had instructed him that a day would come where you would save this people and as he began to walk around the people that time bomb began to tick and he didn't know why he felt the compulsion so you're there trying to come to terms with god's calling but god now looks at a situation where it's empty void and god reaches into himself and pulls out the piece of himself needed and speaks it and god talks it and god releases it in the atmosphere and the bible says he calls child he calls the things that don't exist as though they are now god doesn't speak in future tense have you noticed God doesn't talk to you about your future. That's why when God gives you an instruction, you always believe it's to be done now because God has no future tense. 
like I said in Christian, like I said in scripture, eternity means yesterday, today, and tomorrow in the mind of God at one moment. And that one moment was the moment at the finished work of Calvary. Before Calvary, the Old Testament speaks futuristically. The New Testament speaks as if it's already done. Because in God's mind, all of eternity revolves around one moment. There is no tomorrow with God. Talk to me somebody. Time is a function of the earth realm. So God doesn't talk about the future. Like the future. God begins to discuss with himself and with you about your tomorrow as though it already exists so god says gideon mighty man of valor gideon's like excuse me do you know who i am i'm hiding a wine press god says don't get it twisted gideon i'm not talking to you now mary magdalene i'm not speaking to the prostitute i'm looking at your future and so god begins to talk and begins to instruct and begins to do because he's calling things that don't exist as though they were you know why because they already exist on the inside of him amen and when the clouds are full when God has laid the framework in the realm of the spirit then God now rolls up his sleeves and starts to physically do what is required are you with me talk to me somebody God now says okay now that man exists now that the animals exist where did they exist inside God God created them inside himself. He called them the thing, the Bible says the things that be not. So as at when he was calling them, they still were not. Because he called them inside him. Ephesians 1 4 says, God has called us inside himself from the foundations of the world. So when God begins to speak, the things begin to materialize inside him. And when he's ready, he stoops down and he begins to unpack it. And how does he unpack it? He doesn't sit his backside down at home. No, no, no. He rolls up his sleeves. He puts his backside in gear. He gets his hands dirty and he begins to release. So the architect says, put that wall there. Put that brick there. Put that window there. And the things that have been called suddenly begin to appear. And when God is finished with all his work, the Bible says he looks at it. Wait for this, wait for this, wait for this. He looks at it. Listen, listen. And you know how God finishes his work? He gives it a name. How do you call a child? Lynette. God finished her. Then gave her a name. And the word name means essence, character, and description. And from that day, from the mid, when God pronounces the name on the thing. The Bible says Adam operated in the faith of God. God made the animals, brought them to Adam, and Adam gave them names. And whatever name Adam gave them, the Bible says that they were. What it means is, when, see, when Adam called a dog a dog, whatever dog in Hebrew is, it was the instruction of what Adam said that told the dog to bark, to wag its tail, to go on all fours. The expression of the essence of the animal was conveyed in the name of the animal. So God finishes Lucifer, makes him, tablets, hops, everything. And God, now he's just a shell. And God says, Lucifer. What Lucifer means, light bearer. And, the, and talk to me, somebody. And the minute God pronounces the name on him, Lucifer takes on the image of the glory of God. Now we know he fell, but stick with me. Are you getting me? He takes on the image of the glory of God. God finishes his work by calling it a name. And this is where most of us miss it. Many of us don't speak. We try to do before talking. There's a business idea in your spirit. You start running around printing cards. Shut up, sit down and talk. Call the thing forth. I call for the investors. I call for the clients. I call for the office furniture. I call for the website. You begin to create the thing in existence. Come on, talk to me somebody. Before there was an Ecclesia Kingdom Center, I was speaking. 2000 was when God spoke to me and I began to talk. I told everybody, put my vision down on a piece of paper. My pastor told me, you're crazy. You're mad. I said, no, 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 no. Someday there's going to be a church. Oh, la maraba kuta la baba sata. I said, someday there's going to be a church where praise and worship has no time. I spoke it into being. I, said, oh, lo, le, na, ma, na, ma, ma. I, I called it forth. 
I walked into this building. It was a warehouse. I said the stage will be there. Amen. Talk to me, somebody. I said there will be chairs there. I said from day one, the media team will be up there. And we went around. We put it there first. Then there we were looking for an arrangement. Talk to me, somebody. We were physically trying to make happen what had already happened in the spirit. So you talk first. You begin to create inside you. And as you pray, as you declare, as you release, it becomes substance. It becomes concrete. It's no longer just an imagination. Somebody get me a towel, please. No longer just an imagination. No longer just a thought or a desire. It's not a prayer. Listen to me, somebody. It's not a prayer point any longer. Faith is the substance of what you are hoping for. If you are still hoping, it's not yet faith. But as you begin to speak, as you begin to declare, a time comes where it downloads from the heavens, bam, inside your spirit. And then you feel it. You know it. I have it. Then you go to, you go to phase two. You roll up your sleeves. You begin to work. See, faith involves stooping down. The Bible says God stooped down. Proud people can't express faith. Amen. Proud people don't fulfill destiny. Because faith means you can't. This is the problem. When you receive it in the spirit, you are here. But in the natural, look at me somebody. In the natural, you're down there. In the spirit realm, you're a millionaire or billionaire. In the natural realm, thank you. In the natural realm, you're broke, busted and disgusted. And many of us sit up there in the spirit realm in our prayer time, decreeing and decreeing and decreeing, but not doing anything. That's why you die broke. That's why you die single. That's why you die addicted to sin. You now have to stoop out of the realm at which you have received. Back down to ground zero. And your mind is here, but your hands are there. And you transmit what you caught in the spirit realm by your physical activity. Amen. Talk to somebody. So I had to put a Facebook event in 2009. Church opening in Nottingham. And seven people came on the first day. Four of them came with me from Sheffield. Three people from Nottingham. But I had to do something, amen. I had to go and buy a microphone. Talk to me, somebody. Amen. I had to go to YMCA and say, all I have is 24 pounds per week. What can you give me? And they gave me a room the size of the stage. But I had to do something. Talk to me, somebody. Amen. I had to get on my knees and pray. Amen. I had to read my Bible so I had something to preach. Talk to me, somebody. Amen. God spoke to me about my wife when I was 18. Amen. And I was speaking her into being for years. But then when she showed up or when God showed me, I had to walk. And thank God it didn't take me 16 tries. Amen. You know why? Because I did everything in prayer. Unlike Dr. Lanre, I sealed the deal in prayer. I spoke. I wrote a list of all her qualities. None of them physical, all spiritual. I decreed, I declared. I said, rib, find me. And when she showed up, she told me the minute she met me, all the guys that were disturbing her stopped. You know why? Because when God walks into a room, hey, somebody talk to me. And I, you know, I said, you know, in fact, you know what, I actually did some work, you know, I recorded a CD. Amen. I asked my wife out by CD. I was present, recorded it to a backing track. Amen. Edited, mastered it, Fruity Loops. Amen. 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 And I said, can you meet me at so-and-so place after getting permission from my pastor? She's like, my manager didn't talk to me. She was funny. I said, just come, come, you know. And I prayed over that thing and I did over it and as I put it in the CD prayer CD player as it began to play she dropped to her knees she began to cry she said yes but if I start out at home and I create a wife I don't know you gotta get your hands dirty talk to me somebody you gotta get your hands dirty you gotta express the evidence of your faith and this is the final place this is where many Christians miss it you've spoken you've done and it comes to you as a lifeless shell All I had, like Pastor Larry said, I too started ministry with young people. We had £1.50 offering some Sundays. £1.50 with 18 people in church. And I looked and I said, Lord, shall these dry bones live? Because I wasn't thinking about the money. They were so messed up, struggling with sin, fighting issues, killing one another. And God kept saying, mighty men of valor. Amen. You know? Even the older ones. I met Bishop for the first time. He came to my house. And as he walked through the door, God said, that's the guy I told you about. I said, God forbid. I'm being honest. I'm just being, I'm being very honest. I said, God, that can be the guy. 
God was speaking to me about this great mighty man of valor that was going to walk in all these different things. And, and when he came, I said, ah. I said, no, 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 that's not right. I said, prophet. And God said, that's the one. Dry bones. I met Pastor Blessing and Pastor Yemi. Ish. And God began to prophesy and speak. And I said, no, 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 I'm hearing wrong. Because all I saw were dry bones. I looked at myself. Amen. And all I saw was dry bones. And I got taught with the final part of the faith of God. God said, son, when I bring it to you lifeless, you have to name it. So I say, name it. You tell it what it should be. So I began to pray and call their names one by one. Olumide. Then his son name was something else. And I would say, you will serve God. You will, you will be. And I would speak and declare. I said, blessing, you are. And then I would say, tell her. And I would call. I'd speak to Nottingham. I'd speak to this place. I'd speak to the United Kingdom. And I began a name. I began a name. I began a name. And immediately, also gradually, as I was naming, what I didn't realize was what I was calling was gradually manifesting. And then one day God says, Son, um, for the next one month, don't preach in church. Just get all the leaders to preach one by one. And I said, God, by the time they are done, church will be empty. I told God, I said, God, by the time these guys finish, there'll be nobody in church. And then one by one, they began to open their mouths. And I said, Ish, Ish, Rema, Ish, Wed, Ish. I leave church, I'd come back. Ah, preachers were preaching today, and he just broke out, and everybody was getting healed. Ish. Because many times when you've named something, and it begins to manifest, you forget what you named and as God began to name Adam began to name the Bible says whatever he called them they became and that Michael take it down for a bit and that which was not now became take the keyboard down a bit Michael just take the drums down that which was not now became and God saw what he had created Finally, it came to manifestation. And God looked at it and said, it is good. You know why? Because God is good. Jesus said there is only one good. God is not good in that he is a good thing. No, the Bible says God is good. And for anything to be good, it has to have emanated from God. God looked at it and said, aha, that's what I saw inside of me. God took it through quality control and said, this is what I saw on the inside. It is good because it is me. Adam did the same thing when he saw Eve. Flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone, because she came from me. There is nothing more fulfilling in the Christian walk than seeing what you saw. At the hospital yesterday, everybody asked me, were you excited? I said, not too excited. I said, what? I said why? I said, because I saw that boy many times. I told my wife, I said, I saw him many times. About five times over the last nine months, I had a visionary encounter. I saw him from zero to 30. I told her yesterday, the day before, I said, honey, get a good sleep tonight. You will wake up in labor. How do you know? Because I was praying in that room before Friday. And I saw, and God told me, he's coming on the 9th of March. And he's coming with full hair. I saw Amen. Talk to me someone. I saw. When you see in reality what you have seen in your spirit, then you exhale and say it is good. That's why Christianity is so tiresome for many Christians because they never get to see what they saw in their spirit. Never get to see. It gets tiresome being in perpetual labor without releasing anything because we don't apply the faith of God but even more even more what's the word I'm looking for now disastrous than not seeing in reality what you saw in your spirit is the crime somebody say the crime 
because this is a crime is the crime of never seeing anything in your spirit in the first place and many Christians die without never having seen anything in their spirit never created anything in their soul never fashioned anything in their belly how can you bring forth what you have not created worse still I said my final point as I close if you don't apply the faith of God you are indirectly applying the faith of Satan and this is the faith of Satan flip it round Satan doesn't do anything new all he does is takes God's principles and flips them many of you are seeing what you created in your spirit years ago you tell yourself nobody loves me nobody will love you many of you have created a picture of failure defeat rejection hopelessness confusion and you have fed that picture you have fed it for years it's become your inner reality and now all you're doing is living it out the Bible says out of the heart flow the issues what issues is fountains the waters the streams of life as a man think it not in his head but in his heart so is he and Satan helps you because God speaks in a still small voice Satan shouts Satan pressures I've learned to distinguish between the voice of God and Satan if something is compelling me negatively to do something now see when God, when God, is, when God is in a rush he knows how to get your attention but if something doesn't want to give you a chance to think it through get to do it, do it, do it, that's Satan forceful, arrogant, brash little thing like, well, let me, let me, wait till I get to heaven and I see him rude insolent no manners, no ethics Satan interrupts your conversations shouts you down I don't even know people like that obnoxious rascals can't hardly get a word in when you speak to them that's the devil God's a gentleman. He speaks when he's allowed. And many of us have allowed that rascal drown out the voice of God. And now we have created, we have received a word, we have heard, and we have received Rema from hell. No one will ever want you. You will never amount to anything. You'll never be free. Never see, you will die broke. All the men in your family beat their wives. Why should you be any different? And this is the voices. And they create faith. And when the faith is full, then we now begin to do. <laughs> See, they begin to compel us to act, to deliver. And then worse still, when we see what we have created. Because until you name it, there's still hope. But the minute you license it, you give it a name. It has jurisdiction to exist on the earth and it becomes perpetual. Stand with me this morning. What faith are you going to demonstrate? I keep stressing these things work for stuff, but I'm not preaching to you about stuff. I'm preaching to you about destiny. I'm not talking about cars and houses and rubbish. I'm talking about the purposes of God for your life, though you you were meant to be. Come on somebody, begin to apply the faith of God. And that's why we must have a prayer life. Not for stuff, because the Bible says, take no heed to what you will eat, drink, and wear. Those things are standard. But have you noticed when you spend time in prayer, ideas begin to pop passions begin to be ignited you begin to desire things because it's see, the true pr purpose of a quiet time is not to scream it's called quiet anyway if the bible says call unto me and i will show you great and mighty things you knew not let me give you a picture for your life December 2007 while praying in Sheffield I had a visionary encounter 
and I saw an entire generation from 18 to 45 on a treadmill to hell and God said son these people will die purposeless godless he didn't have to ask me to quit my job God never said to me once quit your job I got off that floor that day and that picture haunted me and I walked to my mom and my dad I called them I said I know I'm the firstborn I know I have responsibilities I know, I, I'm, I know I'm sorting out this and this but I've got to quit my job they said son you're crazy I said I know but I'm going to do this called my, called my wife I said baby <laughs> I've got to do this why? because I saw something I saw something worth dying for something bigger than me prior to that 2005 I had another vision I saw a city with a demonic principality sat down with the crown on his head and an angel walked me over to it took it off the throne took the crown put it on my head sat me down and says I want you to orchestrate the realm of the spirit over the city of Sheffield and then he said specifically I'm giving you an entire generation of young people and they started coming from nowhere from churches all around the city Prior to that, 2004, I had another encounter. Prior to that, the year 2000, I had another encounter. Prior to that, 1998, I had another encounter. I can point you back to places where God revealed to me. Take the drums down, please. To keep it up. The places where I saw. When God gives you hope. When he gives you a picture of your destiny. Then you can begin to exercise the faith of God. you got to speak it. Talk it. That's why we pray in tongues. The Bible says we know not what to pray. But the spirit helps our infirmities. Enables us to utter or to make groanings that cannot be uttered. That's why you must speak positively. Declare God's counsel concerning your children. I told my son, you're prince of God. All the days of your life you will fulfill. I said, you will not know sickness or disease. You will not know the fallen Adamic nature because the minute you are able to make a conscious decision, you will serve God. I speak over this house every day. Your great house. Your great people. Your generals. You're the fullness of the expression of God. I call names and I speak into your future. I speak into your destiny. When you come telling me how you messed up, I say, shut up. I don't see you that way. I see you this way. And I refuse to talk to you about that because this is what I see. And then you must act. You must do. You must line up your actions with what you see. And finally, you must name, learn to call the things that be not as though they are. Gideon, your mighty man. Abraham, your friend of God, even though you lie. David, you're a man after my heart, even though you're a 17-year-old guy with sexual issues. Simon, you are Peter. Even though every time you open your mouth, you put your foot in it. You begin to call, speak to the situation, give it a name. Call it a multi-million dollar business. You're running it from your bedroom. But give it a name. I've given Nottingham a name. It's called Bethel. I changed the name of this city, the spirit. This is Bethel. This is Eden. This is Zion. This is the gateway of heaven. And that's why crime had to go down when we started. It's halved in the last few years. Crime in this area 
It's almost non-existent now. But we're not done yet. We're calling. We're naming. We're, we're creating. Until we see one day. Till we look like God and say, Aha, that is good. Call that wife. Call that husband. Call that child. Call your purity. Call your anointing. Call your gifting. Call it from the depth of your spirit. Mandebo shatala bahaya. Oh, hallelujah. Na, 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 ba. Come on, someone, put those hands together for God this morning. Like you know it's done. Look at that future. Look at that destiny. And praise God for it. Come on. Clap your hands, oh you people. And shout to the Lord with the voice of triumph. Come on, come on, come on. One more time, one more time. One more time, one more time, one more time. Hallelujah!